with that being said, welcome again. And uh, today it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you all, and actually welcome to our Lucy Cavendish stage, my close friend, Dr. Maria Calzani, and her mom, Dr. Maria Rosa Pozzi. <laughs> Pozzi? Sorry, I, I, I forgive me for, <laughs> for butchering the pronunciations. Um, they are a very unique mother-daughter duo of COVID-19 warriors, if you will. And uh, with, uh, with Dr. Uh, with Rosa Pozzi just um, battling as um, uh, COVID-19 as, um, uh, as a medic on the front lines in Milan, in Italy, and uh, Dr. Colzani uh, actually um, trying to understand how SARS-CoV-2 works at the bench side all the way up here in Cambridge. So just to give you a brief introduction, uh, Maria Colzani is uh, currently a postdoctoral fellow um, with the MRC Waltham Trust uh, Stem Cell Institute um, at the Addenbrook site. And she is uh, currently carrying on research under the supervision of Dr. Sanjay Sinha. And prior to that, she received her uh, PhD in hematology in Dr. Cedric Gabert's lab right here in Cambridge in 2012. And before that, she had specialized in molecular biology and in biotechnology during her undergrad and master's. So currently her research is actually focusing on how to, um, uh, how to uh, use stem cell derived cardiomyocytes or heart muscle cells and how to um, use this technology to repair injured hearts after heart failure. So absolutely fascinating research. But when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, um, Maria found herself in a very unique situation where she was able to immediately reconfigure her, uh, her research to understand the cardiovascular aspects of SARS-CoV-2 as we all, infection, as we all know, um, people with underlying cardiovascular um, uh, problems are highly susceptible to severe disease and often um, uh, it leads to fatality. And uh, Maria has been uh, has reconfigured her research to to understand this more thoroughly, and hopefully she'll be talking today a little bit about some of those exciting results. Um, the reason I wanted to um, bring in both uh, Maria and her mother is because they're actually there's this very inspiring tale for me at least. Um, all the way out here, um, you know, I'm, I'm far away from my family. I'm always anxious and concerned about them. And here you have these two very brave um, people who've been uh, able to uh, bond over, their, uh, over the pandemic as they've um, battled it on very different lines. So Dr. Um, Maria Rosa Pozzi actually obtained her uh, medical degree from the University of Milan back in 1984. And she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Washington U University in St. Louis, studying the uh, T cell receptor. And uh, eventually she moved on to work at the Cancer Research Institute in Milan, where she was working on mammary carcinomas. Her specialization in clinical medicine is actually in immunology and later on in, uh, in rheumatology. And currently she actually um, uh, is the director of the rheumatology in, uh, unit at the San Gerardo University Hospital at Monza. And uh, once the pandemic broke out, she was brought into the front lines and where she has since been treating the most severely ill uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. And today she's here to tell us uh, some of the most um, uh, uh, some of the most touching tales, I believe, from uh, from her experiences as a uh, uh, frontline, um, for lack of a better word, warrior. <laughs> and with that, I will let you two take the stage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashwarya, for the kind introduction. Um, Mom, I think your microphone is muted. Okay. Uh, and you might want to share the screen. Okay. Okay. So I'm just, yes. I'm just going to quickly um, give an introduction. Uh, so, Mom, if you move to the first slide. 
yeah, just to give you a little bit of a background and to put things into uh, context. So um, Italy went into full lockdown on the 9th of March and uh, UK uh, followed reasonably shortly after on the 26th of March. And during all of this time, of course, all the healthcare systems around the world had to quickly react and reorganize to uh, adequately uh, respond to this pandemic. And they've changed quite dramatically. And in parallel, research also changed, um, academic research also changed dramatically. In Cambridge, as you all know, uh, all the university basically shut down, including all the research labs with the exception of the ones carrying out COVID-related uh, COVID research. And in this talk, really, what uh, we hope we're going to be able to share with you is the experience of how one of the biggest university hospitals in Lombardia in Italy has reacted to this uh, pandemic. And after, we're going to show also how academic research in, in, in my lab has been uh, reshaped by, uh, by COVID-19. And hopefully at the end, we're going to be able to highlight the growing importance of this link that exists between bench and bedside Side, especially in the uh, fight against uh, the coronavirus. And with this, I'm going to uh, hand over the floor to uh, my mom, uh, which is going to talk to you about the hospital side of things uh, in Italy. So, uh, good evening, everybody. First of all, uh, uh, thank you to invite me to share my experience in COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, for this talk, uh, I'm going to focus just uh, on the story of our hospital and how it completely changed uh, in the pandemic spread. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will not discuss uh, any therapy strategy and how we treat uh, patients. However, if anybody is interested uh, in uh, uh, these aspects, I will do my best to answer your question at the end of the talk. My name is Maria Rosa. Uh, I work in San Gerardo Hospital, one of the biggest hospitals in Lombardia, the region that was mostly hit by COVID-19 in Italy. For almost 24 years, I worked in internal medicine uh, after my first uh, period in, in the lab. And uh, since uh, five years, I am the head of the rheumatology unit, really, a, small one <laughs> and my prevalent activities now is uh, ambulatory care of patients. To date almost 35,000 people died in Italy due to COVID-19 and 50% of the total death is concentrated in, Lombard in Lombardia. Monza, uh, this is the, the Lombardia in Italy and Monza is here and this green area is the Monza province, la provincia di Monza, Monza province. And Monza is very close to Milano and to Bergamo, the epicenters of the epidemic. Um, the uh, residents in Lombardia are like 10, mm, mil, 10 millions of patients, of uh, inhabitants. And uh, in Monza, Brianza province, uh, uh, one uh, eight hundred uh, thousand people. Uh, this picture show you the San Gerardo Hospital. This is the main building, and this one is the building where I work. Usually work the uh, ambulatory care, care building. Here there is the building of the University of Milano Bicocca Medical School. Here there are the uh, emergency room area. And here there are the um, uh, buildings of pediatric and uh, infectious diseases. Um, the, to make the things more complicated in this period, since uh, uh, six years, a complex building renovation is ongoing in our hospital, as you can see from the pictures. And, um, uh, this process required us to move uh, uh, from one sector to another. This is the old sector, this is the new one, the renovation. And uh, um, 
this uh, we had to redraw in the hospital organization the renovation of this sector the first one just ended at the end of february so uh, was uh, and the renovation uh, was done without uh, uh, stop any clinical services so we work and the hospital was uh, changed well before the storm in january and february 2020 everybody knew about covid-19 of course but nobody really believed that the enemy was at our door really it was uh, quite quite strange but was that the real thing in our emergency room, only one room was devoted to potential infected people with a common tri triage facility for everyone coming in. There were not uh, different paths for the triage. February 21, the fifth COVID-19 patient was diagnosed in Codony Hospital, was a really severe patient and in necessity was uh, transferred in an uh, ICU unit in Pavia. February 23, the first COVID patient came from Crema, a uh, town uh, near to Codogno, to our ICU ward, and the storm began. Uh, almost immediately, 16 out of uh, 24 ICU beds were devoted to COVID-19 patients. Elective surgeries were stopped and some surgery wards were, became COVID wards. Stroke unit, coronary care unit, cardiology and internal medicine wards were preserved at the beginning. All day surgery activities were stopped, but all the other outpatient activities like mine were maintained. For a while. The emergency room tri triage changed and a big tent uh, served as the path for suspected COVID patients just to, uh, to avoid com to, to put together people infected and not, not infected. In a few days, as the number of patients increased, not only infectious disease and pneumology ward became COVID-19 ward, but also internal medicine, geriatry, gastroenterology turned into COVID-19 wards. Only oncology, hematology, and nephrology wards were maintained. Obstetric and pediatric developed specific guidelines to early identification of infected kids. And every one of us, no matter his previous role, was involved in COVID-19 patient care. Uh, here you can see two graphs. I will uh, try to um, explain you. The first one uh, shows the uh, number of patients uh, that were uh, uh, hospitalized. This is March and this is May. The yellow line is our hospitalized patient. You can see they increase really rapidly in March and then they slowly uh, um, uh, decrease. decrease. Uh, the brown line are people that are discharged from the hospital. As you can see, they increase uh, until uh, almost uh, 800 patients at the end of May. And the blue line are dead patients. In the other graph, you can see day by day in, uh, yeah, in brown, uh, the hospitalized patient. In blue, the patient in ICU. And in yellow, the patients that are in the emergency room. And you can see in April, uh, almost 400 patients were hospitalized and uh, almost uh, 100 patients uh, or 70 patients in uh, uh, ICU. 
uh, here you can see uh, the um, female male uh, ratio because uh, the male are the almost 65 percent of the hospitalized patient um, and uh, here you can see the mean age of the dead people 76 here this is the mean age of the hospitalized patient and this is the mean age of the patient in ICU. And uh, these are facilities and 88 still hospitalized. This is the end of May. Nowadays, we don't have any patient with COVID in our hospital. Well, <laughs> this is me <laughs> with two my colleagues before to go into the wards at the beginning of the turn. And it's just a, a kind of a meeting uh, between the people that ended and people that going to start. Um, every day, uh, we meet uh, more or less at 1 p.m. to decide how to allocate doctors and nurses in the new COVID wards, opened day by day, really. We opened uh, at least 25 beds uh, every day for the first 15 days of March, or may maybe for the, 10, the first 10 days of March. We try to create uh, uh, teams with people with different sk clinical skills, uh, just to have uh, different, uh, uh, in, in a way to guarantee the presence of people uh, of, phys of physician with expertise in non-invasive uh, um, ventilation technique uh, like uh, CPAP, uh, uh, that is um, uh, really quite uh, well known in our, uh, in our hospital. Uh, um, all the people uh, involved uh, in internal medicine uh, wards are able to uh, use uh, the CPAP and also the nurses. So we arrive to have uh, 120 CPAP in our hospital outside the ICU facilities. Well, ICU, at the beginning, 25 beds. In a uh, uh, few days, uh, they opened uh, other beds, uh, and we arrived to have uh, 20, 100 beds uh, of uh, ICU for uh, uh, invasive ventilation. Um, one floor of the building uh, for the ambulatory outpatient care, out, outpatient patient, outpatient, sorry for the um, uh, ambulatory care um, became an ICU ward with 40 beds for invasive ventilation. 181 COVID-19 patients needed invasive ventilation in our hospital. And you can see a link just to a small a short video uh, on uh, our uh, ICU ward. Just uh, to uh, say you how the uh, how, how quickly our work changed, and uh, in eight of March we had sixty nine COVID nineteen inpatients. 29th of March, so 20 days later, the patients were 420. And at the end, we took care of about uh, 1,500 uh, 1, COVID-19 patients. And it was a big, a big <laughs> burden. And the mortality in uh, rate in ICU was about 30%. Uh, and just to consider the um, 
ARDS uh, mortality rate is uh, quite good, but so really impressive. Uh, 29 of April, the pressure uh, is really less and less day by day, and we start to reduce uh, the COVID-19 beds, and we start to open the so-called COVID-free walls, and we just uh, had to take care of all other patients that in some way stay away from the hospital. And uh, the 1st of June, I returned to my usual job. I returned to be a rheumatologist. <laughs> but uh, I was just uh, out of my places because uh, the ICU uh, ward was still where I have my, <laughs> my office and uh, my uh, rooms. And uh, I came back uh, to my building uh, in July, 7th of July, because the uh, new ICU ward was closed. And the old uh, ICU ward was restructured to guarantee the possibility to admit the COVID-19 patient, preventing the contamination of non-COVID-19 patient. And also we have a kind of filter ward that host the patients coming from emergency room while waiting the uh, swab result just to avoid to mix infected with non-infected patients but it's, a, um, it's quite difficult but now really uh, we are very happy because uh, the, the patients are all discharged Uh, the numbers, as you can see, Lombardia and Monza province. And as you can see, uh, this graph shows the uh, percentage of total population infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, at, the, at the end of July, 25 of July. And you can see um, uh, Monza, the, the 0.67% of the population of uh, Monza, uh, the province, uh, is uh, quite uh, low respect to the Bergamo province or Cremona province. Mm. And also uh, the, the death toll in Monza province alone was 900 people. Um, this number seems to be low, but really was a, a very, very hard battle. Uh, the San Gerardo Hospital is also uh, a, the main teaching hospital of the, Universita, of, the, of the University of Milano di Cocca Medical School. Uh, so in March, a joint project uh, between hospital and, and medical school uh, started uh, to collect uh, biological material from leftover of blood sample and swab, swab um, as well as clinical data of COVID-19 patients. And uh, this database called the STORM uh, uh, from uh, the studio observazionale is a, a kind of observational study on the natural history of uh, the hospitalized patient with COVID-19. Uh, uh, this database includes uh, data of uh, 1,500 COVID patients. And uh, mm, this project uh, we think will allow the realization of many studies uh, sharing the data with everybody who is interested. And uh, as you can see, this paper published on the New England Journal of Medicine was done uh, with uh, uh, clinical data and uh, biological samples of patients also from our hospital. They came from uh, seven uh, hospitals in uh, Italy and Spain, the place uh, more. Uh, 
hit by the uh, AP. And so I can thank my colleagues, uh, all the people uh, in the hospital. We had uh, a really hard time, but uh, now it seems uh, much better, and we hope uh, not to have a second <laughs> round uh, of uh, the epidemic. And uh, I will uh, have to thank all my family, my husband, Leonardo, Anna and Andrea, <laughs> and my cats. And I thank all of you uh, to invite me and uh, for your, <laughs> and I can just apologize for my English, but <laughs> I hope they, uh, I can, uh, I, I hope that my message was enough, clear, clear enough. Thank you. M Okay, uh, can you hear me or, and see my screen? Yes. Good. So, yes, so just um, taking over from, so moving from the bed side to the bench side. So as uh, Ashwarya very kindly uh, introduced me, so I am a postdoc in Sanjay Sina's lab and the overall aim of our lab is to develop new treatments for cardiovascular diseases using our expertise in uh, development, regeneration, and disease modeling. And um, as you can imagine, uh, our work has come to a relatively uh, abrupt stop um, during the, um, at the start of this pandemic. And uh, actually, some of our uh, clinical colleagues went back to the front line to help uh, the um, to help patients in um, in the hospital. And uh, our research also changed uh, quite drastically, as uh, Ashwarya has um, has mentioned before. And um, so I hope that today I'm going to be able to explain what we're doing and why we think that is uh, important. And I just want to put a disclaimer out. So I'm not a virologist and I've never worked in infectious diseases before. But uh, again, I hope that I'm going to be able to deliver you some basic information that will help you understand our work in the fight against, uh, against the coronavirus. So I am sure that most of you uh, might have already seen a picture of the virus in the news that looks a little bit like something like this, but uh, I want you to pay attention to the schematics just below that illustrates the um, overall structure of the virus. So what does this virus look like? So this uh, virus is composed by uh, a membrane and this membrane contains the uh, Genome, the genome, the RNA genomic, the genomic RNA of the um, of the virus, which contains all the information that are necessary for this virus to replicate and propagate the uh, infection. And um, um, I want you to pay attention to this uh, red flower-like uh, structure that you can see here, which is called the spike protein. And I want you to pay attention to the spike protein because this protein is uh, the key to the viral entry of the um, to the viral entry into the cell. So, and key is actually an appropriate uh, analogy. And like every key, it actually needs uh, a lock to um, to enter. And in the case of um, SARS-CoV-2, the actual lock is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, so ACE2. So ACE2 is um, present on the surface of the human cells. And the virus via the spike protein is able to dock on the ACE2. And once it docks and bounds on, uh, onto ACE2, it's then able to enter the cells. And once it enters the cells, he hijacks all the cellular machinery and he is able to replicate itself many times, leading to the release of new viral particles that then um, 
help spread the, the uh, infection, uh, infection further. It is important to know that ACE2, which is the lock for the, um, um, for the viral entry, so it's the main port of entry of the virus, it's not present everywhere in our body but uh, uh, only in specific location. So you can see here in, our, uh, in this graph that it's present in the upper airways and in the lungs, not surprisingly, as these are the main uh, point of entry for the uh, infection and the lungs are the most uh, affected organ. However, of interest to us, being a lab interest in cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular research, you can also see that ACE2 is present in the heart and in the vasculature. So that piqued our interest. So you might ask why, so what is actually the cardiovascular involvement uh, in COVID-19? Basically, it is a fact widely known that the predominant clinical manifestation of COVID-19 is viral pneumonia. So where do we fit in this context? So there's increasing links of a, um, between COVID-19 and the cardiovascular system. So first of all, this, both the susceptibility and the outcomes of COVID-19 are strongly associated with, the, uh, with cardiovascular diseases. And also there's uh, been several reports now that uh, have uh, shown how COVID-19 infection can promote cardiovascular disorders such as myocardial injuries or arrhythmias. And last, uh, as a sign that COVID-19 is also involved in the vasculature, there is uh, an increasing evidence that it causes uh, thromboembolism. And um, for the rest of my talk and the main interest of our lab is to try to understand what are the mechanisms that lead to uh, heart damage. So currently, we have three different hypotheses that we're trying to test. The first hypothesis is that the virus is actually able to directly infect the heart and cause damage. The hypothesis number two is that the damage to the heart is actually secondary to the inflammatory response generated by the viral infection in the lungs. So our immune system is trying to fight the uh, virus in the lungs and in doing so, it can cause like an overreaction and just like too much of a of response that can then have um, uh, damaging effect on the heart. And the third hypothesis is linked to the fact that we do in see an increase in uh, thrombotic events. And one could imagine that, you know, like if you have these microthrombi circulating, these microthrombi can effectively cause micro infarct that then obviously trigger uh, heart, uh, heart damage. So these are our hypotheses. And so what, how are we testing these hypotheses? In order to uh, make you understand what, how we're going to do that, I need to, to um, explain just very briefly what we do in the SINA lab. So in the SINA lab, we work with pluripotent stem cells coming from different origins. And these uh, pluripotent stem cells are cells that are able to differentiate in all the tissue of the body. So cardiac cells, neurons, gut, every tissue. And what we do particularly well in the, uh, in the SINA lab is actually uh, generate cells from the vasculature. So we can generate endothelial cells, which, is, which are the innermost layer of the blood vessel, and the um, uh, small muscle cells, which are the uh, intermediate, which compose the intermediate layer of the, uh, of the blood vessel. Furthermore, we are also able to, um, to generate uh, cells for the heart, so cardiomyocytes, which are the main beating cells of the heart, and we are able to uh, produce these contractile cells and to generate artificial beating tissues that you can see uh, that you can see here. And uh, it is important to understand that when we are studying human diseases, it's not easy to actually have access to primary human cells, especially if they come from organs such as the heart or the blood vessel. So it's, they're not easy to come by. So our system, uh, we believe, represents a good um, model in a dish for several diseases. And we actually believe that it can represent a good uh, in vitro model for COVID-19 uh, disease too. So, 
I just told you that we think that uh, our cells are a good model, and um, but we would just before we started all of this, we just want to make sure that actually we have a good system to test uh, um, to test our hypothesis. So what we did is uh, we took a um, tissue section from adult human heart, and um, you can, that you can see here on the left. What we did is we identified the uh, uh, cardiomyocytes, so the beating cells of the heart, by looking at the presence of this uh, marker here called troponin T. This protein is specific to the cardiomyocytes, so only the cardiomyocytes express this protein. We then have a look at ACE2, which I remind you is the port of entry of the virus in cardiomyocytes. And what you can see here in, uh, in green is that there is a substantial proportion of red cells, so of um, cardiomyocytes, that do um, present ACE2. I also want to point out that uh, not all of the red cells are green, meaning that the presence of ACE2 in the heart is heterogeneous, so not, or not all of the cells have the potential to be infected. So what about our cells? What about the cells that we generate in vitro in the lab? So this here uh, are flow cytometry data from uh, our cells. I will not um, explain the technique in details, but what you can see here in red is ACE2. What you can see here in fuchsia is um, troponin T. And these are the percentage of cells that present the troponin T, which is basically almost all of them. And this is the percentage of cells that present ACE2, so around 30%. And this is quite reflective of what we do see in the adult human heart. So like pretty much all of the cells red, uh, so troponin, um, troponin positive, and only a few uh, presenting, presenting ACE2. So we're reasonably sure that we are looking at a physiological model and that we can carry on in our study. I want to stress to you that the, when we're working with the new virus quite infectious and um and quite dangerous really it's not easy and it's not easy because of course there are there are health and safety regulations that are put in place to make sure that the work is done properly so only um fully trained personnel in highly specialized room is actually allowed to work with the real virus however here is where molecular biology comes to help so what we can do is try to create tools that will allow us to actually study the viral infection without necessarily looking, uh, um, without necessarily using the real virus. So I mentioned multiple times now that the main mechanism of entry is the um, spike protein that you can see here. And what our collaborators have done is actually create an artificial form of the spike protein that is identical to the actual spike protein, but it has been fused to what we call a fluorophore. You can imagine a fluorophore like a light bulb, and we can choose the color of the light bulb, and this helps us with the visualization of the spike protein. So what we can do is actually then throw these fluorescent spike proteins onto our cell and then see if it binds. And what you can see here in the upper right panel is exactly that. So you can see here in, in gold and, and, uh, and blue our cardiomyocytes, and you can see in red the spike protein. And you can see that, yes, we do see the red, so this light bulb coming up in our cells. And this represents um, the fact that actually this spike protein can bind, and therefore this can be seen as a proxy of uh, potential um, <coughs> SARS-CoV-2 infection in our cells. So again, we do think that there is potential of the virus to actually infect uh, heart cells. We then moved one step uh, forward, and uh, to do so, we actually generated um, artificial viruses called pseudotype viruses. So these are non-infectious viral particles. And the way that they are structured is that they are composed of um, a, a membrane, seen here in red, that contains um, <clears throat> genetic information to encode for a light bulb. Again, in this case, uh, a, green, uh, a green light bulb. And we can decorate the membrane of the virus with different, uh, with different proteins, so with different 
key to enter the cell. So we can kind of, from what we then did was to, we generated a control uh, virus, which basically contains um, a protein in the membrane that can enter, that can infect all cells. So it's sort of like a universal key. And as a counterpart, we generated a pseudotype, uh, spike pseudotype virus that on the membrane presents the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So just like the actual SARS-CoV-2, but with the uh, beneficial effect that these particles are non-infectious because they, can, they do not contain the genetic material necessary to replicate. But we can use them as a proxy for the real virus. So this virus, if they're able to bind to the cell and to enter the cell, are able to then transfer the information necessary to uh, turn this light bulb on. So again, in this case, we chose green. And what you can see here on the right is that, as expected, with our control virus, pretty much all of our cells turn up green. And this is because this virus has the capacity to infect all the cells. When we then did the same thing with the virus containing the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, we can see that only a certain percentage of cells gets infected. Again, and this is in agreement with the data that we've seen before that have shown that the actual uh, lock, the gateway for, for, for the uh, viral entry is not expressed on all of the cells, but just on 30% of them. So again, we have pretty good evidence that um, hypothesis one can be true and that the virus could potentially infect the heart and cause uh, direct damage. Of course, the next step would be to test the real virus and uh, on these cells and uh, we are working to make the, the, uh, that happen. But moving on, I just want to quickly talk to you about uh, our hypothesis number two, which is that the damage to the heart is not due to a primary infection, so it's not due to the virus infecting the heart, or maybe like not only related to direct infection, but it can, that it can actually be um, secondary to the inflammation generated by the viral infection in the lung. So by an overreaction of the immune system that then uh, damages several organs, including the heart. So how can we test this in our system? So to do so, we actually took advantage of the fact that Addenbrooke Hospital has established the COVID immunophenotyping program as part of the National Bioresource Study. And as part of this body of work, the blood samples of uh, all patients admitted into hospital with COVID-19 are collected together with all the clinical uh, data. So we can then look into this, uh, look into this database and collect the serum of this patient. And just for those who might not know, the serum is the non-cellular part of the, uh, of the blood and it contains all the mediators of inflammation, so all the molecules and mediators that are released by the immune system. So we, what we plan to do is take the serum from these patients and healthy control, treat our cells and look if there are any cytotoxic effects. For the sake of, uh, of time, I'm not gonna talk to you about our third hypothesis and how we're gonna uh, try to test uh, the effect of thrombosis on, uh, on, on the cardiomyocyte. But overall, I hope that in this uh, brief talk, I was able to show how our um, pluripotent stem cell derived cardiovascular cell rep really represent a suitable and important model to study uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection at different levels. And uh, I really think, well, we really think that this model system can lead to a better understanding of what are the features of this virus and how, um, how this uh, then uh, trigger this specific COVID-19 pathology. And I hope that overall, like as a main message of the talk, I just want to stress how, how like really our working hypothesis has been really guided by the clinical, uh, by the clinical findings. And I hope that in time, all these hypotheses that we are testing in the lab can really help to pave the way towards a develop, development of preventive and, but also therapeutic solution. And indeed, we hope that our platform can soon be turned into a drug screening platform to have a look at potential um, therapeutic solution. And with this, uh, I'm going to uh, conclude. And uh, I want to thank uh, everybody uh, from my lab 
and all the incredible, uh, all my incredible collaborators that really have helped me massively um, with this uh, rich research. And I want to give a special thanks to my uh, clinical colleagues, including my mom, for all the endless discussions that have really guided us through these um, the formulation of our hypothesis and to uh, establishing this, this, this pipeline for our research. I also want to thank the British Health Foundation because they've been incredibly fast uh, to react into this, uh, to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, and they actually awarded us with the money necessary to carry out this, uh, this research. And of course, last but not least, I want to thank, uh, thank you guys for uh, inviting me and um, uh, and for the attention during this uh, this talk. And yes, and with this, I'm gonna stop and ready for questions. Thank you so much to both of you. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. And yeah, you're right. It's uh, it's it's really wonderful to see how you both of you, just mother and daughter, you can discuss this and. Uh, <laughs> No, it's 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 indeed wonderful, and I'm I'm glad to see that COVID nineteen has at least spurred more collaboration between clinicians and bench scientists as well. Um, and with that, I would like to open up the session for questions. It looks like we already have um, two or three questions. I invite all uh, all of you uh, who do have more questions, please do go ahead and type it in the chat function. Um, so the first two, I believe, are for Dr. Maria Rosa. Um, and uh, it's from Sue James. Sue, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question, or do you want me to read it out? Okay, well, I'll ask the question, but um, it was just two questions, and they were both pretty simple ones, being a non-medic. But one was, if we've worked out why men seem to be more affected than women, that was on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, just looking from a medical, from the point of view of being doctors, suddenly faced with this sort of rapid emergency, you know, how did you keep your morale up given that 30% of ICU pa patients died and you know, it must have been all quite shocking? Uh, I will start from the second part of your question. The first one is quite difficult to, <laughs> uh, to answer, um, but the, uh, is what really, really hard because uh, we didn't have time also to think about. Uh, and the worst things was that uh, in uh, outside of uh, ICU, we had station that uh, uh, we know probably will never go to ICU. When uh, they were hospitalized, uh, we have to decide according to the age, uh, the comorbidities, uh, the, situa the general situation, who has the best chance to uh, benefit of the ICU. And also for my uh, intensivist uh, colleagues, it was really, really hard to decide. And um, uh, I remember a couple of patients, I was really um, so, uh, sad and so worried because uh, I knew that uh, if there is no place in ICU, they will gonna die. And uh, also we were really, really uh, tired because uh, uh, for six weeks, uh, I had one night turn uh, each week, I mean, from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And you cannot uh, almost drink because uh, you have uh, all the stuff, uh, the, <laughs> the, the mask, the, the gloves, uh, the uniform and so on. And at the beginning, we didn't have uh, very much uh, uh, Mm, uh, protective devices. So uh, every one of us adds uh, the just a couple of masks, uh, uh, just a suit, and uh, you have to, uh, I mean, 
stay <laughs> dressed for all your turn and you cannot go outside from the world and uh, so also the was quite hard uh, to work in this condition and the worst thing was at the beginning that uh, maybe uh, 10 12 patients came just uh, during the night and you have to take care of them all of them and to take care of all the, the, the one that are just uh, there and are not going so well. And uh, also the beginning was quite hard because we didn't have enough device for non-invasive ventilation. So the CPAP balloon, uh, all the um, uh, mechanical device. And so we just uh, had to uh, ask uh, for all the hospital uh, well you have this one i will give you that one and really was really stressing um i don't know why the men are um, preferred by the covid virus there are some hypotheses but i i, I don't i'm not able to uh, say you for sure this is the right one so that's still to be found. Yeah, can I just um, jump in on that? I think that there have been like reports first, you know, like in, in China that have linked it to the um, uh, prevalence of uh, smokers in the, the male population. But then, you know, like that is, is not true, you know, like for the for the Western country. But they, uh, I think it has I've seen some other uh, work on bioarchive that are linked to the prevalence, for example, of cardiovascular or some of the cardiovascular diseases in, um, in the men population, so that it can be for the prevalence of some of the comorbidities, but there's not like irrefutable proof uh, as to what is actually happening. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is actually from my dad, all the way from India. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you want to ask the question? Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is for Dr. Maria. Uh, see, I was uh, as I was listening to your talk, you were mentioning about the 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 coronavirus promotes the uh, the cardiovascular problems. Now we are getting reports in India from the patients who have fully recovered from the infection and uh, got back to their homes. They are complaining of related issues uh, so probably it confirms that uh, even after getting fully recovered the heart problems may arise in the patients who are having the covid virus in them so is there any way out right now can you suggest something is there any finding from the research yes yeah, so thanks for your question um so Actually, one of the problems of heart damage and myocardial injury is that um, the heart in general has very little capacity to regenerate. So it means that once the damage is done, then it's, that's, that's kind of it at the, at the moment. So uh, what I would say that, you know, like, yes, that's why potentially there, there are like these long lasting effects. So in terms of potential uh, potential therapies, and then you like um, only now I think that as people start start recovering, you know, like more and more study emerges of what then are the long term effects of this disease, and it's not just you know like if uh, finally the virus is gone, you survive, your swab comes back negative. It doesn't mean that you are completely healed. It's not just the heart. There's been reports of neurological problems. So I think that yes, you know, like in the next years. The, the, the research really should also be focused on how do you follow up from the from the infection. However, again, again, I'm not a doctor, but you know, like from my understanding of the biology of the heart, once you have this, this damage and if the if sufficient cells die, like in the heart, then there's not a lot of chances to uh, to recover. And actually, you know, like one of the main things that we're trying to do. In, in the lab is actually working to promote cardiac regeneration by a variety of, of strategies. So maybe in the future, we will also be able to help, uh, to help with this. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. 
thank you. And uh, the next question is from from Leia. Uh, Leia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. Um, hello. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was a bit curious about uh, the whole procedure of changing your research topic um, because I have never really heard of something like that. And, um, I'm just curious who made the decision, who who came up with this idea and was it hard for you to start working with new techniques and probably also new equipment? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. So actually, um, again, I think that we were in a particularly, well, for lack of a better word, lucky, even if uh, <laughs> uh, you might not say this in uh, given the circumstances, but uh, we have um, uh, clinicians working in our lab as researchers. And actually, you know, like, even just before the, the lockdown, uh, when like the first reports start emerging, uh, we started talking about you know, like, is, is, it, is it possible to, to do something? And, um, and actually, we're also in a lucky position that our model system was already present in the lab. So we didn't have to change the model system. So our cells were there, we knew how to make them. So, you know, they, they, they were there. And then uh, you're right, you know, like uh, when you're changing topic and you need to uh, work with new techniques, it's not, it's not easy. So there was like a lot of reading, a lot of, uh, you know, Zoom calls to discuss strategy with, you know, like colleagues and, um, and things like that. But I have to say, that's why, you know, like I, huge thanks really to my collaborators in like other labs specifically in immunology and infectious disease again chances uh, you know like um lucky again because the infectious disease and immunology unit is just one floor above uh, our lab so it was very easy and people there were super super helpful and they really helped me and guided me uh, in the uh, in the experiments that, that we made. So um, again, I, I don't think I've seen this many collaboration burn in such a little such a little time and that's why we were able to shape up uh, a project. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was an absolutely wonderful talk. Um, I have some questions for you, Maria, but I'll keep that for lab meeting. That's it. <laughs> Um, but just do, uh, but if I might uh, ask a question of your mom, uh, Dr. Fozzi, um, just to sort of follow up on what my, my, my father was asking, do you, in your hospital in San Gerardo, did you get a lot of patients who, who were discharged coming back for follow-up treatments for either heart problems or respiratory problems? Well, um, really, I can say that we have a kind of... Uh, um, follow up of these patients, and they are seen by the pneumologist, cardiologist, uh, mm -hmm. infectious disease special, uh, inf infectious disease specialist, um, and they are collecting data. Uh, I just uh, talk with the, my co pneumologist colleague, and they are quite amazed because uh, they were less. Uh, uh, they, they were quite um, afraid about the possibility to have a kind of uh, um, respiratory, chronic respiratory failure after the COVID pneumonia, but it, they, they, the patient recovered quite well. I don't know about the uh, cardiac involvement because we don't have, I didn't have the impression that the cardiac involvement was so um, uh, frequent, uh, but uh, you know, um, uh, we just uh, live uh, in a kind of storm and it was uh, difficult to analyze data. And uh, now I had to come back to my work and I had to uh, reshape my activity. I have just to call all the patients that uh, <laughs> stay home and now <laughs> they need to be. Uh, Followed and uh, and so uh, I, I don't have really the uh, precise uh, situation on my um, uh, ends, but um, well, we are doing 
to this kind of follow up uh, with the um, multidisciplinary uh, specialties uh, to follow these patients. Well, thank you very much. And now we're actually out of time. Uh, thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. And uh, a huge applause to Dr. Maria Calzani and Dr. Maria Rosipozzi. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Milan. Uh, we really appreciate this. Um, this talk has been recorded and we will post it on our uh, Lucy Cavendish website and also on our YouTube channel and uh, those will be available in the next couple of days. So thank you again and uh, for wonderful thank insights. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>